Hello booktube, my name is Elizabeth. Welcome or welcome back to my channel, Bookends and Books. This video is my pile of possibilities for a brand new readathon created just a few days, a few weeks, has it been two weeks, not even two weeks, created just a few days ago by Shelley Swearingen. It is the Read Historical Fiction Readathon. Um, she noticed that historical fiction is very popular on booktube and yet there's no event dedicated to it, so she decided to create one. There was one a few years ago hosted by Katie from Books and Things, uh, but that event was a one-off uh, and Katie had said so, it was for one year only and it was very popular. So Shelley decided to create an event where she invites us to read historical fiction and I have a lot of it. Um, I went to my shelves and my cart and I saw a lot of historical fiction that is unread. So this will be the perfect event to pick them up. Now, um, I said this is a pile of possibilities. Now, I, I always presume that you know what everything means when I talk, obviously, but that, that you know the booktube lingo. So uh, a pile of possibilities as opposed to a TBR. TBR is to be read. And the TBR very often kind of is ambitious in the sense that somebody says, I will read this. This is to be read. This is what I'm going to read. Or this is what I am very seriously attempting to... to well, I will seriously attempt to try to read. Anyway, there's something very serious about the TBR. Um, and, and some people can feel the pressure of the TBR. Personally, I prefer the pile of possibilities. Uh, the term was created by Kazan from the channel Always Doing, who, who seems to be on hold at the moment, or anyway, Kazan hasn't done a video in quite a while, uh, in, since the fall, I think. I hope she's going to come back. Um, but anyway, she created the, the term piles of, pile of possibilities uh, just to just to relieve the pressure a little bit. And the spirit of the pile of possibility is that a little bit like a little kid, you know, when you go visit family or friends and there's a kid who's like five years old and the kid wants to show you his room and he just grabs you by the hand and takes you to his room and then he starts to show you every toy that he has. So this one is named da 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 and he does da da da. This one does do 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 and he can do this and that one you know, something like that. So this is exactly what I'm going to do. I'm just going to show you a whole bunch of books. This one is doing this. This one is about that. And I haven't read them because like the kid, the kid cannot possibly play with all of these toys in a, in a week, in a month, probably not even a year, but doesn't matter. They are there. They are available for, for, for the kid to play with them when he wants them. And and so are my books. I, I, I can play when I can play with them <laughs> whenever I want to. They're there. So now I'm just going to show you all the books one by one. So that book does this and that book does that like if I was a five-year-old kid. So a power of possibilities is me playing with my toys <laughs> or showing you the toys that I can play with. Um, so that's the spirit of the pile of possibilities. Uh, so the pile of possibilities, it, it's somewhat follows the prompts that Shelley uh, created. So Shelley created a bingo board uh, in color. My printer is not in color, so this is in black and white, but if you had a color printer, you're going to have something that is even prettier than this. Um, and uh, there's a bunch of prompts, and I have something for every prompt, and for some prompts I have even more than one possibilities. Uh, so I'm going to start with the prompt, read a work of historical fiction set in the country you're from. Uh, I'm starting with that one because I have really only one possibility and it's a bit of a cheat. Um, I don't think she really set a specific date, like what counts as historical fiction or not. She consulted a few, um, a few websites that have a definition and very often the time gap between the moment the book is written and the events depicted in the novel. It's 50 or 60 years or more. Uh, in the case of this book, it's 40 years. The gap is 40 years. It was published in 2010. So this is, um, oh, the title in English, I forgot to check. It's probably, uh, the, I'm going to go for the Constellation of the Links. So uh, that, that, that would be the <laughs> direct translation as you can figure it out. Um, if it's not, anyway, regardless of what the title is, I'm going to write the titles of all of the books in the description box in case you're uh, interested and in case you just don't want to listen to me for like half an hour. <laughs> um, and also I'm going to leave a link to Shelley's channel in the description 
description box and to uh, her announcement. So, uh, so as I said, the book, this book was published in 2010, and it is about the events of October 1970 in, in the province of Quebec. So what is called the October crisis. Uh, what happened then was that there was a political crisis and there was a, a group, a terrorist group that wanted uh, the independence of the province of Quebec. And they were very much inspired by the IRA in Ireland and in the UK. Um, so they, they were putting bombs everywhere. They were robbing banks or trying to rob banks. Um, and, and they, they wanted to, to take arms to promote the uh, independence of the province of Quebec. And there was an escalation. Things kept kept getting bigger and bigger. And in 1970, in October 1970, there was a crisis uh, because the group abducted two people. They abducted a British diplomat and they abducted a um, the uh, Quebec Minister of Labour. And the second man was actually killed. He died at the hands of uh, the, um, the terrorists. Uh, the official version is that he died trying to escape. However, it's rather dubious, um, probably not. Anyway, um, so uh, this novel is about these events. Oh, in 1970, uh, it was the, um, uh, at that time, uh, the, the then Prime Minister Pierre Elliott Trudeau, the father of current Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, quite famously invoked the uh, Wars Measures Act, War Measures Act, and that suspended every right and freedom. Uh, so that meant that the police could enter your house without a warrant, could search it without a warrant, could seize anything without a warrant, and including you, they could arrest you without a warrant, chuck you in jail without a warrant, and keep you there without taking you in front of a judge for however long they needed. So the law was used, some say abused, um, and yeah, it, 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 it's still a scar in it, for, for many people. I wasn't alive then, so I don't, I have no recollection of it, obviously, but it, it's, a, it's an event that still has a lot of weight in contemporary politics. So uh, this is a novel about that. Uh, that being said, it's, it's really a novel. It's not a recreation of the event in fictional form. The characters are fictional and the events that the specific events that happen to the characters are also fictional. There are some real names dropped in the middle, uh, dropped into there, and the main, the main, um, the main, uh, I don't know, sort of grid behind the, the main events are, are still there, like the, the abduction of the two people that I mentioned and the War Measures Act and all of that. That's going to be in the book. But the characters in and of themselves are fictional. So this is a work of fiction. And um, so, so that's my candidate for that particular prompt. And I have no other candidate for that prompt. So that means that for uh, the other opposite prompt, read a work of historical fiction set in a different country to the one you're from, that means every other book will fit that particular prompt. So I don't have anything specific for, specific for that because all of my books will fit that. Um, so next, which prompt do I go to next? Okay, I'll go for the first one, top, top left corner. Um, read a work of historical fiction with a speculative or magical realistic element. Now, I am not much into magical, re uh, well, magical realism, I don't mind, but speculative or um, fantasy, I'm not into that at all. However, I do love a good, um, a good classic with a lot of gods involved, such as The Iliad by Homer, translated by Emily Wilson. Now, it's because of Shelley and David Wilson that I read The Iliad for the first time. Uh, during her first year on Booktube, Shelley and David had a book club, uh, the Eclectic Book Club, where they chose a book every month, and I decided to join for the reading of The Iliad and I just fell in love with it. Um, so I've read the Robert Graves translation and the Robert Fitzgerald translation. So that would be my third translation of the Iliad. Uh, so this is the one by Emily Wilson. And I say it's historical fiction. It, it's an epic poem, so it's not a novel. Uh, but it, for the Greeks who wrote it, wh whoever Homer is, at the time the, the epic poem was put on paper, well, not paper, but whatever whatever support they had at the time, the events depicted had happened a long time ago. So this is about mythical times. And however, um, the, 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 we can question whether the events happened or not, whether there really was a Trojan War or not, whether it really opposed a Mycenae and Athens and all the Greek city-states or states. And uh, at the time, I don't know if they were city-states, but all the Greek kingdoms uh, to the, the kingdoms on the other side, um, to the Trojan kingdom. 
you can question whether it happened or not, but I'm pretty sure that whatever that was written, there was no doubt in the writer's mind that the events had happened. Whether they actually believed that the gods were involved and that there was supernatural events happening, I don't know. But at the very least, they thought that the events were real. I I I'm sure. So that's my candidate for um, for um, the, the, the the first prompt, which is uh, read a work of historical fiction with a speculative or magical realistic element. So the speculative aspect is that there's a bunch of gods that are involved, like actively involved in the battle. So obviously it didn't happen. Um, but anyway, so that's my choice. Um, Next, uh, read a classic work of historical fiction. Now, I have a lot of choice for that. Um, I've never read The Hunchback of Notre Dame, but it's not, I, I cannot find it in this little room. <laughs> like the kid showing you all the toys in his room. I just chose books that are in this room so that they reside normally on that shelf or in the cart that is behind the chair, neither of which you can see, which is just over there. Um, so I just used what I could find readily available and um, so I couldn't find the, um, the, the, that, uh, the Hunchback of Notre Dame. Um, other possibilities could be some rereads. I could reread some Walter Scott or read some Walter Scott because it's been a while. Uh, I read Hive and Ho and I've read uh, Quentin Durward, which I really loved both of them, but I read them in French. And once upon a time, 20, 25 years ago, I tried to read Rob Roy in English and there's like Scottish pattern, like speech written in it, um, and and I, I, I couldn't read that. It j I just couldn't understand it. So perhaps with 20 years of experience of reading English and just being better in English in general, perhaps I could read it. Uh, or perhaps not, perhaps the audiobook would be good for that, just, just to have, so that the, 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 the phonetic writing could, could be translated as to English. <laughs> because when I read it's not always clear how it's supposed to sound. So there's these possibilities that are would be reads or rereads. Uh, but there's also this. <laughs> uh, so no, the author is not Harold Bloom. The author is Shakespeare. And this is Julius Caesar. And that's a play. Um, and it's based on historical event, the assassination of Julius Caesar and the aftermath. So this is a play. Again, it's not a novel per se, but it's definitely fiction and it's a very good one. Um, and it's a classic, so totally fits the prompt. Uh, next, what do I have? Read a work of historical fiction set in a new to you historical time period. Again, it depends how you define time period, because if we go by sort of broad, broad stroke period, like antiquity, middle ages, modern times. I've read something for every period, so there's nothing new. However, if we narrow it just a bit more, well, a lot more, and saying a period being defined as actually a place and specific events or a specific few years, then there's tons of time and places about which I've never read anything. Um, candidates, the main candidates. So the main candidates for that particular prompt would be a novel translated from Czech, because I've never read any historical fiction about the Czech Republic or the Czech part of the Austrian Empire or the, that particular region of the world. Not true. I've read about the assassination of Heydrich. Um, um, anyway, um, <laughs> before, the 20, before World War II, I haven't read anything set in the Czech Republic. And this is For Jack in Love by uh, Josef Skvoreski, I think. Mark from Book Time with Elvis could correct me. Um, so it's quite obvious. It's about the composer Dvorak, and apparently he's in love. I don't know anything else about that book, except that I am a um, sucker for anything involving a musician, a classical musician in a book. Whenever I'm very often disappointed, but nevertheless, when I see like Dvorak or Beethoven or Mozart in a novel, it's like, oh, I want to read that. And yeah, doesn't always go well, but but I, nevertheless, I want to read that. Um, and another candidate would be uh, a book that I showed you in the previous video. It's one of the books that I found in uh, my father's bookshelves. Uh, this Imperial Woman by Pearl S. Buck. So this is about the last Empress of China. And I have never read a historical fiction about the um, the fall the or the last years of the Chinese Empire. So... Um, I assume the, oh, I didn't check. I assume it's more than 50 years between the moment uh, Pearl Buck wrote this and the last events depicted in the book. Um, 
Oh yes, she died in 1908. So the woman died in 19, the, 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 not Pearl Buck, but the uh, last Empress of China died in 1908. So that means that if this was published in 1950 something, or oh, please make it 58. 56, hmm, not quite. 48 years. Anyway, it's going to do. It's historical fiction. <laughs> I say I say it works. So that's another candidate for that particular prompt. Uh, the next prompt is read a work of historical fiction from the perspective of an ordinary person. Now, th that sort of kind of assumes that it's, it's a first person narrative. And I don't know if I have anything like that. Um, but I, I have, if we consider main character rather than the perspective, like the narrative voice, um, if we consider that it's just the main character is, um, is a bit of a nobody, an ordinary person, then I have quite a few candidates. So, uh, this one, uh, this is children of all nation, children or child, child of all nations, uh, by, again, the name that I can never pronounce, Pramoy. Pramo Adia Anantator. Anyway, um, <laughs> I say anyway, uh, he's an Indonesian author. I got the book on sale. I should remove that. Well, in case you're new to my channel, I like to keep the price tags of the book on the book because I, I don't know. I think it's an interesting information. So I got the book on sale. Um, so anyway, this is volume two of a, a four, four book historical novel. It was written in the 19, I'm going to say 1980s, 19, something like that. Um, and while the author was in prison, uh, he, he was jailed for political reasons and uh, the book was banned. He wrote it in, um, he, he wrote it, uh, how do you say that? He, he was hiding his writing when he was uh, writing the book because he was not supposed to write anything while he was in jail. And it was with the help of various other inmates or people visiting him or however it worked, perhaps a bit of corruption, who knows. Um, he managed to smuggle the manuscript out outside of the prison and it managed to get published uh but uh but but uh, yeah so uh this is the second volume i read the first one last year it was very very good it is set in indonesia but at the time before it was really indonesia at the time it was a colony of uh the netherlands and this is set just at the end very very end of the 19th century early 20th century so i think the last events in the first book were in the year 900 and i'm pretty sure we're going to pick up exactly where we left so th this is probably set in nine nine nineteen hundred. 1900 um and 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 perhaps a bit later so that that's uh so and the main character is just uh the main character was the the son of a local administrator and um for for the um for the colonizers for the for, for for the netherlands he was an absolute nobody because he wasn't dutch so that that's that's an ordinary person um, another one, uh, The Dictionary of Lost Words by Pip Williams. Uh, that book was rather popular a few years ago. This is about the daughter of a, uh, of a man who writes the Oxford Dictionary. So it's set in Britain in the, is it 19th century? Set in the early 20th century. Okay, early 20th century, so about 100 years ago. So definitely a historical novel. And then the last possibility for that particular uh, prompt uh, is a book, again, that I showed you in my previous video because I hauled it from my father's bookshelves. It is Anna Fowler by um, Janice Holt Giles. Giles, sorry. Um, and it is set in Kentucky. So this is a story of a woman, um, a, a settler, colonizer, going in the West. Well, Kentucky was then, I suppose, in the West. Um, in the 19th century, just... Um, yeah, just trying to, to uh, make a living in the somewhat wilderness then of, uh, of Kentucky. So that, that's, uh, that's that. That's that. <laughs> Next. Um, and then we have sort of the opposite prompt, which is read a work of historical fiction from the perspective of an extraordinary person. Now, again, um, I don't know if, if, if it's going to be a first person narration. Probably not. Uh, but I'm just going to consider it as being about uh, a famous person so um, or an extraordinary person, because I'm sure that even the ordinary people in the um, in the other books, if they are worth writing about, then they must be extraordinary characters. Um, but um, but yeah, I'm, so I'm just going to, to interpret ordinary and extraordinary as nobody versus famous. So books about famous people featuring famous people, I have again quite a few of those. Um, another one that I showed you, uh, 
in my last video, The Conqueror's Wife uh, by, um, by Noel B. Gerson. So it's about uh, William the Conqueror and his wife, Lady Matilda. And I have actually started it. And I am at page, I am at page 35. And so far, it's really, really good. So uh, yeah, maybe that one will not be for the readathon for June. Perhaps it's not. Perhaps I'm going to have finished it before we reach June. Who knows? Uh, then, after A Conqueror, I have An Emperor, so The Memoirs of Hadrian by Marguerite Yourcenar. Um, so this is about Roman Emperor Hadrian. Um, yeah. And then uh, I have a book that, again, I showed you um, in, in March. Uh, this is Taiko by um, Aiji Yoshikawa. So this one I found in a used bookstore. It doesn't have a dust jacket. It's a big, big book. I started it for March of the Mammoth because there's like 900 pages in this book. Yeah, 920. Um, and I did start it in March, but after reading a few pages, I sort of got distracted and then I stopped reading it for no good reason because the book was very, very good. So um, I may very well pick it up for the event. However, if I pick this one up, chances are I'm going to read, I'm not going to read as many of the others as I would like because as I said, it's 920 pages, even though it doesn't quite show. It, it, it's thin paper. It's a very good quality book. I got stuck at page 48. Well, probably I would start from the beginning, just reading diagonally for the first 48 pages and then continue at regular tempo. Um, and then uh, the final famous character or extraordinary person that is a candidate uh, for that prompt, King Jesus by Robert Graves. So obviously this is a historical novel about Jesus. Um, so, um, yep, uh, I don't think I have to explain who Jesus is. I I'll presume that you know. <laughs> and then uh, the last prompt is read a work of historical mystery or historical romance. So of course I have tons of those too. Uh, I just took out uh, a sample of each. Uh, so here is uh, Regency Buck by Georgette Heyer. So obviously that's a romance and obviously it's set during the Regency. I have quite a few of those. So this is just a possibility among many others that I can pick from. And uh, for the mystery, I took out Ellis Peters, The Holy Thief. Yes, The Holy Thief, which is the 19th in the series of The Brother Cat File. I've read eight or nine in The Brother Cat File. No, I think I've read just eight. Eight of the, um, of the first, eight of the first nine. I think I haven't read number three. But anyway, they, they are all super good. I really love them and they're really good. So uh, that, that's a possibility. Oh, I have another one there that I also started for... Um, that I started for March Mystery Madness, uh, but I haven't finished. Uh, I'm at page very exactly 100. I would probably have to start over because I probably wouldn't remember the names of all the characters. So this is The Death of Achilles by Boris Akunin, and it is set in uh, 19th century Russia. So I don't know the exact year. Well, I probably did in March. Now I don't remember. I think it's 1880 something or 1860 something. Anyway, it's it's the, the second half of the 19th century and it is set in Russia, so St. Petersburg or, or Moscow. Um, this particular case is probably Moscow because we can recognize the, the Kremlin here and the um, um, Basilica, the... Um, I forgot the name of the Basilica. Anyway, doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> the very famous basilica in, 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 in just, just in front of the Kremlin on the Red Square in, in, in Moscow that I've seen in, in for real. Oh, I, oh, darn. Is it Alzheimer's kicking in? I cannot find the name that I'm looking for. There's no Alzheimer's in my family. I, I should be just fine. I'm just kidding. Um, but anyway, um, anyway, so <laughs> it doesn't matter. It bothers me. What's the name of the basilica? Ah, oh, I, I cannot think of it. Anyway, 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 that's it. So that was the last prompt in the um, Saint Basil. That's that's why I cannot remember the name. Is it the Basilic Saint Basil? Is that possible? Doesn't make sense. Anyway, anyway. <laughs> Time for me to stop this video. Um, so, so this is my pile of possibilities for the wonderful new readathon hosted by Shay Swearingen. Um, it, it, 
these are all my toys. Uh, am I really going to play with all of them? Of course not. I'm just showing you the toys because it's fun to show you the toys too. It's fun to play with them, but it's fun to show them. So um, I'm probably going to really, really start with, uh, whoops, not this one, but um, I'm going to continue with uh, this one, uh, The Conqueror's Wife, and I'm going to tell you if it's good or not. Um, and then for the others, we'll see. Um, as I, as you saw, there's a lot of possibilities. And as I always do for Pile of Possibilities, I always end up reading something else. So I may go to the library and read something else entirely, or I may buy something new and read something new entirely. Who knows? So, um, so anyway, so thank you everyone for watching and I will see you in the next video. A la prochaine.